Derby had been married more than three years on that August day when I got that telegram from Maine. I had not seen him for two months, but had heard he was away on business. Asneth was supposed to be with him, though watchful gossip declared there was someone upstairs in the house behind the doubly curtain windows. They had watched the purchases made by the servants. And now the town marshal of Chesuncook had wired of the draggled madman who stumbled out of the woods with delirious ravings and screamed to me for protection. It was Edward, and he had been just able to recall his own name and address. Chesuncook is close to the wildest, deepest, and least explored forest belt in Maine and it took a whole day of feverish jolting through fantastic and forbidding scenery to get there in a car. I found Derby in a cell at the town farm, vacillating between frenzy and apathy. He knew me at once and began pouring out a meaningless, half-incoherent torrent of words in my direction. Dan, Dan, for God's sake, the pit of the Shigos, down the six thousand steps, the abomination of abominations. I, I never would let her take me, and then I found myself there. Dia, Shum, Nigaroth. The shape rose up from the altar, and there were five hundred that howled. The hooded thing bleated, Kamog, Kamog. That was old Ephron's secret name in the cavern. I was there, where she promised she wouldn't take me. A minute before, I was locked in the library, and then I was there, where she had gone with my body in the place of an utter blasphemy. The, she, the unholy pit where the black realm begins and the watcher guards the gate. I, 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 I saw a shagot. It changed shape. I, I can't stand it. I'll kill her if she ever sends me there again. I'll kill that entity. Her. Him. It. I'll kill it. I'll kill it with my own hands. It took me an hour to quiet him. But he subsided at last. The next day, I got him decent clothes in the village and set out with him for Arkham. His fury of hysteria was spent, and he was inclined to be silent, though he began muttering darkly to himself when the car passed through Augusta, as if the sight of a city aroused unpleasant memories. It was clear that he did not wish to go home, and considering the fantastic delusions he seemed to have about his wife, delusions undoubtedly springing from some actual hypnotic ordeal to which he had been subjected, I thought it would be better if he did not. I would, I resolved, put him up myself for a time, no matter what unpleasantness it would make with Asneth. Later I would help him get a divorce, for most assuredly there were mental factors which made this marriage suicidal for him. When we struck open country again, Derby's muttering faded away, and I let him nod and drowse on the seat beside me as I drove. During our sunset dash through Porton, the muttering commenced again, more distinctly than before, and as I listened, I caught a stream of utterly insane drivel about Asneth. The extent to which she had preyed on Edward's nerves was plain, for he had woven a whole set of hallucinations around her. His present predicament, he mumbled furtively, was only one of a long series. She was getting hold of him, and he knew that some day she would never let go. Even now, she probably let him go only when she had to, because she couldn't hold on long at a time. She constantly took his body and went to nameless places for nameless rites, leaving him in her body and locking him upstairs. But sometimes she couldn't hold on, and he would find himself suddenly in his own body again in some far-off, horrible, and perhaps unknown place. Sometimes she'd get hold of him again, and sometimes she couldn't. Often he was left stranded somewhere, as I had found him. Time and again, he had to find his own way home from frightful distances, getting somebody to drive the car after he found it. The worst thing was that she was holding on to him longer and longer at a time. She wanted to be a man, to be fully human. That was why she got hold of him. She had sensed the mixture of fine wrought brain 
and weak will in him. Some day she would crowd him out and disappear into his body, disappear to become a great magician like her father and leave him marooned in the female shell that wasn't even quite human. Yes, he knew about the Innsmouth blood now. There had been traffic with things from the sea. It was horrible. And old Ephraim, he had known the secret, and when he grew old, did a hideous thing to keep alive. He wanted to live forever. Asneth would succeed. One successful demonstration had taken place already. As Derby muttered on, I turned to look at him closely verifying the impression of change which an earlier scrutiny had given me. Paradoxically, he seemed in better shape than usual, harder, more normally developed, and without the trace of sickly flabbiness caused by his indolent habits. It was as if he had been really active and properly exercised for the first time in his coddled life, and I judged that Asna's force must have pushed him into unwanted channels of motion and alertness. But just now his mind was in a pitiable state, for he was mumbling wild extravagances about his wife, about black magic, about old Ephraim, and about some revelation which would convince even me. He repeated names which I recognized from bygone browsings in forbidden volumes, and at times made me shudder with a certain thread of mythological consistency or convincing coherence which ran through his maundering. Again and again he would pause, as if to gather courage for some final and terrible disclosure. Dan, Dan, don't you remember him? Wild eyes and unkempt beard that never turned white. He glared at me once, and I never forgot it. Now she glares that way, and I, I know why. He found it in the Necronomicon, the formula. I don't dare tell you the page yet, but when I do, you can read and understand. Then you'll know what has engulfed me. On, 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 body to body to body. He means never to die. The life glow. He knows how to break the link. It can flicker on a while, even when the body is dead. I'll give you hints, and maybe you'll guess. Listen, Dan. Do you know why my wife always takes such pains with that silly backhand writing? Have you ever seen a manuscript of old Ephraim's? Do you want to know why I shivered when I saw some hasty notes Asneth had jotted down? Asneth, is there such a person? Why did they half think there was poison in old Ephraim's stomach? Why do the Gilmans whisper about the way he shrieked like a frightened child when he went mad and Asneth locked him up in the padded attic room where the other had been? Was it old Ephraim's soul that was locked in? Who locked in whom? Why had he been looking for months for someone with a fine mind and weak will? Why did he curse that his daughter wasn't a son? Tell me, Daniel Upton. What devilish exchange was perpetrated in the House of Horror, where that blasphemous monster had his trusting, weak-willed, half-human child at his mercy? Didn't he make it permanent, as she'll do in the end with me? Tell me why that thing that calls itself Asnet writes differently off guard so that you can't tell its script from... Then the thing happened. Derby's voice was rising to a thin, treble scream as he raved, when suddenly it was shut off with an almost mechanical click. I thought of those other occasions at my house when his confidences had abruptly ceased, when I had half fancied that some obscure telepathic wave of Asnes mental force was intervening to keep him silent. This, though, was something altogether different, and I felt infinitely more horrible. The face beside me was twisted almost unrecognizably for a moment, while through the whole body there passed a shivering motion, 
as if all the bones, organs, muscles, nerves, and glands were readjusting themselves to a radically different posture, set of stresses, and general personality. Just where the supreme horror lay, I could not for my life tell. Yet there swept over me such a swamping wave of sickness and repulsion, such a freezing, petrifying sense of utter alienage and abnormality, that my grasp of the wheel grew feeble and uncertain. The figure beside me seemed less like a lifelong friend than like some monstrous intrusion from outer space, some damnable, utterly accursed focus of unknown and malign cosmic force.' 